Afternoon, everybody. I trust you all had a, a peaceful and relaxing Thanksgiving holiday. Glad to hear it. Um, it was very nice. Thank you for asking. The, uh, we did not, at the end of last week, put out a week ahead. So why don't I just start uh, the briefing today uh, by hitting some highlights. Uh, there are, there's actually more on the present schedule, but there's, I've got a whole page full of things that I'll spare you here. So um, we'll keep it short, but there are a couple of things that are important that uh, I want to make sure are uh, something that you're paying attention to. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, the President will travel to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and visit with wounded warriors who are being treated at the hospital uh, and their families. This is something that the President does on the, uh, four or five times a year, uh, and this will be um, the latest installment of that visit. Uh, following the visit, the President will deliver remarks at the National Institutes of Health to congratulate Drs. Collins and Fauci and their teams on the first published results from phase one clinical trials of a promising Ebola, vac Ebola vaccine candidate and to, discuss, and to discuss other fronts on the fight against Ebola. Additionally, the President will use the visit to make the case for prompt congressional action on his emergency funding request to, abat Ebo to combat Ebola uh, here at home and abroad. So, uh, a news newsy visit to the National Institutes of Health um, tomorrow. Uh, those of you who uh, may recall that there were the, the results of this phase one clinical study were actually published uh, on Wednesday evening, I believe, which is a, a pretty inopportune time to make significant news uh, like that available uh, when it's the day before Thanksgiving. But we'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, on Wednesday, the President will deliver remarks and answer questions from a group of business leaders at the quarterly meeting of the Business Roundtable. Uh, this is something that the President has done a couple of times in the past. What will be different about this visit is not only uh, will you have the opportunity to hear the President deliver his opening remarks, you will also have the opportunity to hear from him uh, as he takes questions from those in the audience. So it uh, should be an interesting opportunity. Uh, on Thursday, uh, this is something you've heard us talk about before, the President will host the Summit on College Opportunity at the Ronald Reagan Building. The summit will build on the work from the first College Opportunity Summit last January while launching initiatives in new areas. This year's summit will focus on building sustainable collaborations in communities with strong K-12 and higher education partnerships to encourage college going. Uh, we'll have a little bit more on that. And then uh, that evening, the first family will attend the National Christmas Tree Lighting on the Ellipse. Uh, at, uh, it's at the Ronald Reagan Building, uh, just across the street there. Uh, and then on Friday, the President will host His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan at the White House to consult on regional issues, including efforts to counter ISIL and find a political solution in Syria, provide humanitarian assistance to refugees from the conflicts in Iraq and Syria, and take steps to calm tensions in Jerusalem. Uh, they obviously have a pretty full uh, agenda when the King will visit here on Friday. Uh, we'll do a pool spray in the Oval Office in conjunction with the King's visit, uh, where both leaders will deliver statements. So we have a busy week ahead after uh, the long weekend. Uh, Jim, why don't you get us started with the briefing today? Uh, Josh, I wanted to talk a little bit about today's focus on, on Ferguson. Okay. Um, is, does the President have any plans to go to uh, the community to address it uh, any time in the near future? Uh, I don't have any scheduling announcements to make uh, from here beyond the ones I began the briefing with. Uh, the President uh, was asked this direct question uh, by your colleague Jim Acosta from CNN on Monday evening. Uh, when he spoke about the grand jury's findings. Uh, at the time, the President indicated an openness to traveling to Ferguson, but no specific plans. Um, and that continues to be the case today. Is, is part of that because there's, there's no commitment and because the situation is, is, is still <laughs> fluid there? Or is it that you don't want to highlight one particular case where the facts might still be in dispute? Well, I, I, think the, I think what is evident from some of the announcements you've already seen from us today uh, and from the comments that you'll hear the President make at the stakeholder meeting later this afternoon uh, is that the President and his administration are very focused on the underlying issues that have been um, uh, uncovered in a pretty raw way in Ferguson. Uh, these kinds of issues, the nature of the relationship between uh, law enforcement agencies and the communities they're sworn to serve and protect uh, is, uh, is something that a lot of communities across the country are dealing with, cities large and small. And uh, the President thinks that it's important for us to have a broader uh, discussion uh, on these issues. And 
you know, certainly some of the announcements that we've made today in terms of the community policing initiative that this administration has now uh, rolled out and the, and the task force uh, on policing that will be led by the uh, Philadelphia chief of police and a former uh, DOJ uh, official with a civil rights background, uh, that some of these initiatives are meant to try to address uh, those underlying concerns that are evident not just in Ferguson, but in communities all across the country. Regarding the issue of militarization of police departments through these Pentagon programs, in August when the President first addressed this, he said that there had to be a distinction between the military and domestic law enforcement, quote, he said, we don't want those lines blurred. Today's announcements don't deal with the issue of holding back those federal programs. Why not? Well, for a couple of reasons. The first is that we found that uh, in many cases these programs actually serve a very useful purpose. Uh, and uh, what is needed, however, uh, is much greater consistency in oversight of these programs, uh, primarily in how these programs are structured, uh, how they're implemented, and then how the programs themselves are audited. Uh, the concern that's been expressed about these programs in the past has principally focused, been focused on the equipment and the way that it's used. Uh, and that's why a lot of the focus that uh, you'll see in this report is on uh, training that's offered to law enforcement agencies um, and on transparency, the way in which these acquisitions are communicated to the public or at least made clear to the public. There are certain situations in which these kinds of programs have been useful uh, and contributed significantly to public safety. Uh, the best, I think, and probably most high-profile example that comes to mind is uh, the use by the Boston Police Department uh, of some military equipment in their response to the Boston bombing. Uh, that was uh, uh, equipment that was properly used uh, and was done in a way that would both protect the community but also protect the law enforcement officers that were responding to the situation. Um, but it is not clear uh, that there is a consistency with regard to the way that these programs are implemented, structured, and audited. Uh, and that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, what the President has asked is, uh, you know, at, after the completion of this law enforcement equipment review, the President has asked for the team to come back within 120 days with very specific recommendations uh, about how greater oversight can be implemented uh, to uh, ensure that there's greater consistency uh, in these programs. Um, on another topic, uh, given the President's veto threat yet, uh, last week on the uh, tax extenders package, does that <coughs> suggest that the President doesn't have confidence in Senate Democrats cutting a, a, a proper deal that could, that he could sign? Uh, I, I think the, the veto threat that was issued uh, you know, by White House officials last week uh, was predicated on the idea that the emerging uh, agreement uh, was one that did a whole lot more for well-connected corporations than they did for working people back home. Uh, the President has been very clear that he believes that our economic policies need to be focused on what we can do to benefit middle-class families and those who are trying to get into the middle class uh, because our economy grows best when it's growing from the middle out. Uh, and that should be the focal point uh, of our efforts. And that wasn't uh, reflected in the, in the outlines of the deal that was being reported uh, on Capitol Hill. That said, we stand ready to work with Democrats and Republicans uh, to make progress on this and other economic policies uh, that would grow the economy uh, in the right way. Uh, and by the right way, I mean the way that benefits uh, middle class families and those who are trying to get into the middle class. I think in some ways it's a reflection of the kinds of values uh, that have been on display by Democrats uh, for quite some time now. Uh, the Democrats have worked hard, uh, it, you know, even just going back, just looking at recent history and going back to the uh, efforts uh, led by this administration to help this, comp this country recover from the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, that the priority in the Recovery Act uh, was making sure uh, that working people uh, were getting the kind of help that they needed to recover uh, from, uh, from the economic downturn. Now, it didn't mean uh, that there wasn't also assistance provided to big companies. Uh, you know, obviously the uh, efforts to assist the American auto industry meant that uh, significant sums of, com of money uh, uh, was committed, were committed, to uh, the auto industry. But that was in a way that led uh, directly to job creation. Uh, and, you know, we've since seen, uh, you know, the auto industry or those individual auto companies uh, repay substantial sums to the American taxpayer uh, for those efforts. But the, the threat was rather unusual. I mean, usually those messages are conveyed in ongoing 
talks between the, the, the participants, and it seemed to suggest that somehow the White House was out of those talks and needed to convey this message publicly through a veto. <coughs> Well, uh, you know, I can I, I can confirm for you that the that the and I think this was evident from the reports that these were conversations that were taking place uh, among uh, people who work on Capitol Hill. Uh, but though certainly the White House is eager to participate in uh, discussions about economic policies, including the so-called tax extenders, uh, uh, and 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 putting those policies in place in a way uh, that would uh, uh, not just help the you know well well connected corporations. Uh, but actually offer substantial assistance to working people, too. And, uh, any timing on the uh, Secretary of Defense nomination before the end of the year, uh, sometime in the next two weeks? Uh, I don't have any updates in terms of the timing of that personnel announcement. Okay. Roberta? I want to ask about uh, tomorrow's event at NIH a little bit. Um, why does the President feel he needs to make the case for uh, prompt congressional action on this, the emergency funding request? I mean, is the White House concerned um, is the White House concerned that there's that's not going to happen? That there is some resistance to that request? Well, I'll um, I'll leave it to members of Congress to express their own view and position on you know what we consider to be a pretty urgent national priority. Uh, that there is a need for us to focus the government's response or to continue to focus the government's response, not just on domestic preparedness and the ability of domestic agencies to respond to um, Ebola and other um, disease outbreaks like this. Uh, but also to make sure that we're mobilizing the necessary resources overseas to stop this Ebola outbreak in its tracks in West Africa. Uh, and, uh, you know, the President believes that that's important, uh, and the President believes that it's necessary for Congress to take prompt action uh, on this. I think uh, that any uh, fair-minded look at the recent track record of even top national security priorities through Congress uh, indicates that occasionally these priorities need a little uh, pushing and prodding to get through the process in a timely fashion, and uh, we hope that tomorrow's announcement or tomorrow's events and activities uh, will serve as an effective uh, catalyst for the completion of that very important work. Uh, I, we already have seen expressions of bipartisan support for this proposal, and uh, I would, uh, I would uh, expect that that bipartisan support would endure. So there's, there's no sort of um, signal that this um, needs a little bit of extra pushing and prodding, as you, as you put it? Well, not, not any more than other national security priorities need when they're going through, through Congress. Correct. Um, on, I want to ask about Turkey. Um, can you confirm that the U.S. and Turkey are closing in on a deal to allow the U.S. and allied forces to use uh, Turkish air bases for the fight against ISIL, and that, that there would be a no-fly zone along the Turkey-Syria border? Well, uh, for specific operational questions about the use of uh, air bases in the region, I'd refer to the Department of Defense. Uh, the United States obviously has a very close uh, working relationship with Turkey. They're a NATO ally. Uh, Turkey, as we've discussed on a number of occasions, has a significant vested interest uh, in the resolution of the uh, situation and in the turmoil uh, along their border. They do have this long border uh, with Syria. Uh, that border has been the site of skirmishes already. Uh, that border is also uh, an area where there's a significant humanitarian need that there are hundreds of thousands, I think maybe even more than a million people now, that have been fleeing violence in Syria uh, that have fled to the border with Turkey uh, to try to avoid uh, violence. And that's created a pretty uh, terrible humanitarian situation there. Uh, the Turkish government deserves to be recognized for the significant resources and effort uh, that they've made to try to meet those basic humanitarian needs. Uh, they've done that with the full support of the international community, including the United States of America that continues to be the largest source of bilateral uh, assistance to try to meet uh, the humanitarian situation that's been caused by the violence in Syria. Uh, as it relates to the specific no-fly zone proposal, um, you know, we've made pretty clear on a number of occasions um, that while we're open to discussing a range of options with the Turks, and we certainly uh, value their opinion on matters like this. Uh, we do not believe uh, that um, that a specific no-fly zone um, proposal at this point uh, would best serve the interests that we've all identified in terms of trying to resolve the situation in Syria. So uh, these talks will are ongoing, and we're conti we're going to continue to uh, be open to uh, proposals from uh, our allies in Turkey. Uh, but at this point, we don't believe that. Um, 
you know, that, a, that a no fly zone fits the bill here. Well, during the Vice President's recent visit, were, um, <coughs> were the U.S. And, and Turkey able to sort of narrow in the range of options that you just discussed, that you just alluded to? I'm sorry, say that again. During the Vice President's recent visit, were the U.S. and Turkey able to narrow in the, the range of options that you just alluded to when it comes to you know, sort of um, doing something about that voter, border zone short of a no fly zone? Well, I do understand, based on the readout that I got of the Vice President's trip, that he um, did spend a lot of time uh, discussing this and a whole range of other matters uh, with the Prime Minister and the President, uh, both in uh, some you know, small one-on-one -on -one settings, but also in some broader meetings as well. So. Uh, I know they had an intensive discussion on, on over all these issues, um, but I don't know, uh, I can't characterize for you in any detail really what kind of progress they were able to make in those talks at this point. Okay. April. Josh, I want to go back to Ferguson uh, for a minute. Reverend Jesse Jackson is sending a letter to President Obama asking that he go to Ferguson. He says, at times, a single incident throws a powerful light on a rea reality. Ferguson is one of those times, and to ensure that this reality is not simply discussed in passing, but dealt with, elevated to the top of the national agenda, President Obama should come to Ferguson. What are the considerations uh, in going to Ferguson for a presidential visit, particularly after the grand jury has made its decision and there's no fear of uh, any kind of uh, influencing of that decision? Well, April, I think it's, uh, it's evident that uh, now seven days after the grand jury issued their findings that uh, this is the first question that I'm asked at the briefing and, it's continues, and this continues to be a story that uh, is prominent in place in newspapers all across the country. I think there's no doubt uh, that the issues that are raised in Ferguson are uh, continue to be at the top of the agenda uh, for public discussion in communities across the country. That, uh, that, is, um, that is evident. The, I think the other uh, evidence you have that this is something that the President takes seriously uh, is to look at the uh, announcements that were made by the administration today. Uh, certainly the um, community policing initiative that's announced, a, a commitment of $263 million uh, in investments uh, over three years to uh, offer uh, assistance to law enforcement agencies who are purchasing body-worn cameras, to expand training for law enforcement agencies, to add more resources uh, to police departments that want to pursue reform efforts. Uh, you know, this, this, these resources would also be used to facilitate um, the expansion of programs that um, encourage community leaders and law enforcement agencies to engage in a dialogue that would uh, strengthen the effectiveness of law enforcement agencies uh, and build trust with the communities that they're sworn to serve and protect. You know, after all, I think the President observed on Monday evening that uh, in some of those communities where the lack of trust uh, is most evident, uh, you know, are exactly the same communities where uh, intensive or an intensive law enforcement presence uh, is needed uh, because the crime rates are really high. So, it, you know, it is an unfortunate uh, irony uh, that, you know, that, that in, those, in those communities where the crime rate is the highest, uh, th that uh, sometimes the trust is lowest uh, between members of the community and, and the police force. So uh, the President believes that those issues uh, are worthy of a close examination, not just by federal officials, uh, not just by officials at the state and local level, uh, but by the broader public, that we should have a debate uh, about some of these issues and we should have a conversation uh, about what kinds of changes we can make to our government and to our society uh, to uh, better address some of these concerns, again, that have been laid bare uh, pretty dramatically in Ferguson over the last several months. Yep. And when, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, April. Okay. Um, when you talk about irony, I want to go to the militarization issue and, and this debate situation. There are people on the Hill that are concerned about the militarization. You say uh, in one breath it's a good thing when, it, when there are situations in this country that need those types of forces and equipment to come in. But then on the other hand, there could be uh, overextending of the use of these types of uh, equipment in, in situations like Ferguson. How would you fine tune, what would you tell the congressional leaders on the Hill, how would you fine tune that legislation to be able to deal with, to have the good side and try to correct what has gone wrong with the militarization? Yeah. Uh, let me say a couple of things about that. The first is that 
Uh, it is important, you know, the reason that we do these reviews sometimes is to dig into the facts and have a clear understanding of what uh, is actually contributing to the problem that's been identified. Uh, and the first thing that's important for people to understand is that the majority uh, of the funds that were used for some of these programs that have raised the concern of members of Congress uh, has not been to purchase uh, law enforcement specific equipment, uh, but rather to purchase office equipment uh, and other surplus materials uh, that can be useful in the administration of a law enforcement agency. So uh, that's the first thing that's important for people to understand. Separately from that, uh, the key to the success of these kinds of programs is to ensure that local law enforcement officials who are using the equipment uh, are doing so properly, that they're using this equipment consistent with widely accepted guidelines. Uh, and that's why you know, some of these proposals relate to uh, expanding training. Uh, these proposals also relate to changing the way that these pro programs are structured and implemented and audited so we can make sure that those uh, individuals who are using the equipment have been properly trained to use it in a way that both protects their own safety but also protects the safety of uh, people in the community. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that the, uh, the law enforcement equipment review that was conducted by OMB uh, is just the first step. Uh, what we anticipate and what the review itself uh, suggests uh, is that more specific recommendations and in, indeed maybe even some best practices uh, be put forward in an, in an additional report uh, that will be provided in the next 120 days. So uh, in terms of what specifically should be done to deal with some of the problems that you and members of Congress uh, have raised, uh, you know, we'll have some more specific recommendations uh, on that in the next uh, four months or so. On the police department, um, there's a lot of conversation in this federal quadrant about this spotlight. Everyone has this microscope on the police department because, uh, quote, they're not able to provide competent law enforcement, and two, that the force is not uh, reflective of the community that is 67 percent black. I'm hearing from various persons within this administration and on the Hill that there's a chance of, of at the very least, reorganization or dissembling of that police department. What, are you, can, what can you say about this? Uh, I don't know uh, anything about those specific proposals. You might check with the Department of Justice. They may have uh, some more information on it. I, I can tell you just as a general matter that the, uh, you know, that many of the programs that we're talking about here, uh, uh, in terms of the community policing initiative that has been announced today and some of the other uh, proposed reforms, uh, envision a, uh, a relationship between the federal government and local law enforcement agencies that would help those agencies that feel like they're need of, in need of reform uh, carry out those reforms to make sure that they have the training and the resources that are necessary to enhance uh, uh, crime prevention uh, while at the same time that they're strengthening the bond they have with the communities that they're sworn to serve and to protect. And last question. President Obama, when he came out uh, here uh, that Friday when we did not expect him after the, the uh, verdict um, for George Zimmerman on Trayvon, he said that he would not be the one leading the discussion um, talking about the race discussion. Has he changed his mind now because this has reached the level of the White House in ways that many did not expect? And Bill Clinton had a conversation on race, and it's not unheard of that a president could lead that type of conversation. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say a couple things about that. I think the first thing is, and I think this is evident from the series of announcements that have been made here today, uh, the underlying issues here are broader than just race. Uh, that this goes to sort of the foundational relationship, again, between law enforcement agencies and the communities that they're sworn to serve uh, and to protect. Uh, surely, uh, discussions of race are an important part of that relationship. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but it's more than just that. Uh, and that means that there is more that we can do uh, to try to address some of these underlying problems. And uh, that's, that's what's part and partial of the specific recommendations that have been uh, rolled out today. Uh, it's also part of the task force review that Chief Ramsey and, uh, and Ms. Robinson are conducting. Uh, and it's also part of the uh, review that will be released by OMB uh, in terms of specific recommendations about the use of, uh, uh, of equipment by law enforcement agencies that was obtained, by, uh, obtained from the military. Okay, you bet. John. Uh, Josh, uh, in terms of the uh, recommendations that are made about the militarization of the police departments around the country. Is there any feeling from the White House that those recommendations 
if implemented, would have made a difference in Ferguson? I mean, was the militarization of the police force there uh, part of the problem? Well, I, uh, I think it's, th that's, hard, that's something that's difficult for me to pass judgment on from here, at least in any conclusive way. Um, I suspect that even people in, uh, well, let me just say it this way. I think in general, I think many law enforcement agencies will welcome uh, the sign from the federal government that they're prepared to offer additional training to uh, their men and women in uniform uh, as they uh, use this equipment, as they get trained on this equipment, and as they learn how to properly use it. Again, in a way that both protects the safety of the officers who are using the equipment, uh, but also uh, you know, those in the community that are, are being protected by this equipment. So I think that's, uh, that's the big, biggest part of this. I think it's hard to tell, frankly, uh, uh, at least it's hard for me to tell, or at least hard for me to communicate publicly uh, about any conclusions that have been reached uh, about whether or not additional training uh, would have substantially affected the way that local law enforcement responded to some of the protests we saw in Ferguson over the summer. Because clearly uh, this whole effort comes out of what happened in Ferguson. So is the view that that whole militarization issue was part of the problem? So put aside whether or not better training would have but, but, but was this question of militarization of the Ferguson Police Department part of the problem in Ferguson? Well, it certainly is an issue that's been raised. Uh, and I know that there are some who have been critics of the police department's response that have raised this specific issue. Uh, this is a, an issue, I think, that is relevant to other law enforcement agencies. There are other local police departments who are uh, obtaining equipment from the federal government and from the military to supplement their uh, existing uh, equipment. Now, again, what, what this review found is that the majority of that equipment was not actually, uh, you know, uh, military combat equipment, but was actually surplus office supplies and other things that would be helpful in administering a law enforcement agency. Uh, that said, um, you know, I think that there are, uh, it stands to reason that additional law enforcement agencies uh, would benefit from additional uh, training about the use of this equipment. And I think more importantly, the federal government, and the, the report reflects this, uh, feel, bears some responsibility to ensure that this uh, variety of programs are administered uh, in a way that uh, makes consistent uh, the need for uh, oversight in terms of the way that the program is implemented and structured uh, and ultimately audited. In terms of the stakeholders at the President's meeting with today, uh, I assume some of those are from Ferguson? Uh, some of the people who have been involved in the situation in Ferguson will be at the White House and participating in the discussion today. We'll have a full list of those who are attending the meeting this afternoon when the meeting starts. And, and the money um, that the White House is proposing uh, for use you know, to, 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 to local law enforcement, just to clarify, this would be, you're asking Congress to appropriate this money. This is not money you that's correct. This will be money that will be included in the President's uh, budget proposal next year. Okay, okay. Um, and I had a, a question of going back to um, th this question of the immigration executive actions and what uh, the Republicans are, are talking about doing on the Hill. Okay. Just to clarify, if the Republicans passed a funding bill, um, if, 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 if Congress passed a funding bill uh, that, that tied the President's hands on the immigration executive order, basically undid it or made it impossible to carry out, uh, would the President veto such a bill? Yes. So the President's willing to see the government shut down if uh, Congress is not, you know, tries to tie his hands on immigration? Well, John, you'll be surprised to hear that I see it slightly differently. Uh, I, I actually don't believe uh, that members of Congress, or at least a majority of members of Congress, are going to be uh, willing to go along with an effort to shut down the government in protest over the President's uh, executive actions on immigration. What the President uh, announced about 10 days ago is entirely consistent with the precedent that was established by previous precedents, uh, by previous presidents, uh, and is well within the, uh, the, the legal confines of the law as it relates to uh, prosecutorial discretion. Um, but, and again, you know, it's Senator McConnell uh, the incoming Senate Majority Leader uh, said himself uh, just a week or so after the election, we will not be shutting the government down or threatening to default on the national debt. I think that's a pretty clear statement from, um, you know, among the most influential Republicans in Congress uh, that a government shutdown is not in the offing here. So but would the, is the President willing to go along with this idea that Republicans are now talking about of basically funding all of the government through October of next year except for the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which would be implementing, of course, the uh, immigration changes, making that funding uh, temporary. 
Well, there are a variety of proposals that we've seen uh, be floated uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, as a general matter, uh, it is the view of this administration that Congress should fulfill their responsibility uh, and pass a, uh, a year-long extension of, uh, uh, or a, you know, a pass a, uh, a year-long budget, uh, because that is, uh, uh, A, it's Congress's responsibility to do that. Right. So we're not asking them to do anything heroic, we're asking them to do their job. Uh, but it also has significant and positive benefits for the, econ for the economy, that we're locking in some certainty for businesses, and particularly when we're talking about a, um, uh, an economy that, at least in, in uh, the, a global economy that in some countries is faltering a little bit, uh, doing all that we can to sort of boost our domestic economy uh, seems to be pretty important. It certainly is a top priority of the President's, and Congress can contribute to this in a substantial way, you know, by passing this uh, uh, the, by passing an omnibus. But would the President have a problem of a carve-out where it's basically funding everything except for Homeland Security? Well, that, uh, making that, making Homeland Security the one part of the budget uh, that would be, you know, funded on a temporary basis. Is, does he have a prob problem with that? Well, I recognize that there are a lot of, a lot of ideas that have been, you know, yeah, some, that's one they've been really some are the more creative than others. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, what we would like to see is something that would um, you know, sort of eliminate any uncertainty uh, and just, uh, you know, and pass, a, pass an omnibus. Okay. Mara. Can just to uh, continue on immigration, you made it really clear that people who are eligible for the deferred deportation and work permits will not get Obamacare subsidies, they won't get food stamps, but um, a White House spokes spokesman said they would be eligible for Medicare and Social Security benefits. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding is that they would be eligible for those programs that they pay into. Right. Right. So essentially when it comes to Social Security benefits, if you qualify, I believe if if you pay into it for 40 quarters, uh, that you can begin to collect benefits based on what you paid into the into the program. So, uh, in that case, yes, it would make sense. But that's what differentiates a program like Social Security uh, from uh, other uh, from other programs like uh, Medicaid, for example, uh, the tax credits related to the Affordable Care Act, those but, kinds of things. But, the, but a lot of illegal immigrants are paying in currently, but they're paying <coughs> probably under under fake. Social Security numbers, does that count as their 40 quarters, or does this clock start ticking when they get their DACA um, letter or whatever it is card? Well, I, I think as it relates to the way that this is specifically implemented, I'd refer you to, to DHS uh, on this. My understanding, though, is that uh, once they've paid into the Social Security system for 40 quarters, which is what uh, is the threshold for anybody who is part of that system. Uh, th that that's when they would qualify for receiving Social Security benefits, again, because this is a program that they've paid into. Right, but paid in as legal workers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the question, again, it, it's not exactly clear to me how on such a detailed level this program is implemented. It does seem to me that it would be difficult to verify that you've actually have paid into the program if you're using a fake Social Security number. Now, if there is a way through the implementation of that program that you could do it, um, then maybe there is a way to do it, but that's why I'd encourage you to check with DHS. Okay. They'll know. And just one last question about Ferguson. You know, obviously the president is spending a tremendous amount of time and effort on these issues, um, but you didn't really answer April's questions about why you have decided that a trip to Ferguson is not the right thing for him to do now. Uh, because that's not what we've decided. Uh, no, but I'm asking you why you decided that. Uh, I'm saying we haven't decided that. You haven't decided that he shouldn't go to Ferguson that's now? That's correct. Oh. oh. Cool. So going to well, wait a second. I thought so. The president. You was have no plans to go to Ferguson. That is correct. Right. And, and if that changes, <laughs> we'll let you know. Right. But there must so, be. A, but you must have considered whether going now is a good idea or not. You're certainly leaving open the possibility you might go in the future. That's right. But could you explain the reasons why going now is not a good idea? Well, I, I, I guess I wouldn't characterize it that way. I think what I would say is that the. Uh, that the President wants to have a discussion uh, about some of these issues that have been laid bare in Ferguson, but that uh, directly apply in communities all across the country. Uh, that there is a need in so many communities to strengthen the trust between law enforcement agencies and the communities that they were sworn to serve and protect. Uh, that's, a, that's a national conversation. Uh, it's certainly one that is particularly relevant in Ferguson, uh, but it's relevant in communities large and small all across the country. Uh, that's evident from, you know, the kind of conversation that the President will convene today. Uh, there will be uh, state and local officials and law enforcement officials from communities large and small all across the country. Uh, there will be civil rights leaders from communities all across the country. Uh, and, that's, um, uh, and that's reflective of the kind of conversation the President believes is warranted at this point. Okay. Michelle? Uh, is the President worried that going there would 
make things more explosive or cause a greater reaction? Uh, not particularly. I, again, I think the president is interested in, uh, in having a, a, in making sure that we are focusing on uh, these issues that uh, are resonant, uh, not just in Ferguson, but in communities large and small all across the country. We've seen the White House and administration officials working on this issue for a long time now. Um, the Attorney General going down there, there have been meetings and n a number of phone calls. Um, where is the prevention in, in the response that there's been so far? I mean, have all of these meetings and getting together not identified much that could prevent the kind of continued response that we've seen? In other words, I mean, there, there are a lot of meetings with local leaders. Even today, there are meetings with local leaders. Well, those leaders don't seem to be able to do much within their communities to stop the kind of violence that continues to go on in response. Well, again, I, I do think, Michelle, it's important to um, uh, acknowledge a couple of things. The first is that the vast majority of individuals uh, in Ferguson who were protesting were doing so in a uh, peaceful, responsible way, and I think that uh, I know that uh, your colleagues at CNN, that there are a number of your colleagues that were on the ground in, there in Ferguson, they would know better than I because they were there, but I think they would agree uh, with that sentiment. Uh, I think that is certainly true of protests all across the country. There have been a number of, of, uh, of public protests that have been, um, that have been organized in, uh, again, in communities all across the country, including here in Washington, D.C. The second thing I'll say is that, that the, these are the kinds of issues that I don't think anybody expects that these issues are going to be resolved overnight. These are pretty deep-seated issues that go to uh, years, if not decades, of concern and mistrust that has existed, uh, again, between some law enforcement agencies and law enforcement officials and some members of the community that they're sworn to, to serve and protect. So um, that means that these are problems that are not going to get solved overnight. That, frankly, is why we need to see the kind of sustained commitment to addressing these challenges that the president is proposing, uh, because he recognizes that not just one presidential trip to Ferguson is going to solve the problem here, uh, but rather a sustained commitment that looks at some of the underlying issues uh, is the way that we're going to get to uh, to the bottom of this and to try to create the kind of environment where, uh, you know, again, particularly in those communities where law enforcement resources are most needed, uh, those are the places where we need to redouble our efforts to try to bring about uh, some greater understanding and trust. Uh, between uh, law enforcement agencies, between police officers who are lo walking the beat, uh, and the people who live in these communities. I find it interesting that the federal government gives some of these communities that need the resources, this excess military equipment and other stuff, but then they can't really use it because now we're seeing that that could escalate the situation. And in, in none of the report do I see where, I mean, there's an emphasis on training, but there's not an emphasis necessarily, at least not yet, on looking at what was given and then taking it back. Is it a possibility that some of these communities will need to give back some of the equipment? Uh, I didn't see that raised in the report either. I'd, I would encourage you to check with the Office of Management and Budget that put the report together. Uh, what we think is the overwhelming, or the conclusion of the report indicates that the overwhelming need uh, is to address two things. One is the way in which these programs are structured and implemented and audited. Uh, to make sure that appropriate equipment is getting, uh, uh, is being sent to uh, the appropriate law enforcement agency. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you alluded to it, is making sure that those ag law enforcement officials at the local level who will be responsible for using this equipment uh, have the proper training to use this equipment in a way that's consistent with protecting their safety and also protecting the safety uh, of people in these communities. And that is. Um, that is what we think will address the vast majority of the problems uh, or concerns that have already been raised about this issue. Yeah, let's say, I mean, a lot of these same issues came up during the, the <coughs> Trayvon Martin shooting, and that was different because it didn't involve law enforcement, at least not at first. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think was learned during that? I mean, there was, a, there was a federal investigation of that. What was the outcome of that, and what was learned from that that could be then put on this situation? Well, I believe there actually is still an ongoing uh, Department of Justice investigation to that uh, situation right, as well. It's still so, going on, right? uh, that, I, that's my understanding, yes. So I'd refer you to the Department of Justice about the status of that uh, ongoing investigation. I, I, I'm hesitant to say too much about it just because there is an ongoing investigation. Okay. Thanks. Nadia. Thank you, Jeff. There is a group of um, Iraqi Sunni leaders who are in town and they meet with the high level U.S. officials. Is the president one of them? 
And can you confirm um, the reports that says that there is a plan that the United States is training 100,000 Iraqis to fight ISIS in what they call the National Guard? Uh, can you repeat the first part of your first question again? You said there are a group of people in town? Yeah, the tribal uh, leaders are visiting today. Are they in Washington, D.C.? Correct. Okay. Are they meeting with the president tomorrow? Uh, I'm not aware of any meeting like that. Uh, there's not one on the president's schedule. Uh, but I'd encourage you to, could, to check with my colleagues at the National Security Council who may have more uh, information about uh, any meetings that are planned uh, with those individuals who are in town. Okay. Uh, there has been a concerted effort uh, by the United States and our coalition partners uh, to work intensively in Iraq uh, on the ground there. Uh, to train the Iraqi security forces. And there has been an, a proposal from some of Iraq's political leaders for the creation of uh, this, these National Guard elements that essentially would be uh, based in the communities where these individuals live. Uh, and uh, the, the United States and our coalition partners have been supportive uh, of, those, of that kind of creative thinking in terms of uh, supporting the Iraqi central government uh, as they take greater responsibility for the security of their country. Again, that's the only way that we're going to address the situation in Iraq, uh, is if we uh, can support an inclusive central government that will actually successfully take responsibility uh, for the security situation in the entire country. Uh, that, is, uh, that, that too is difficult work and the kind of work uh, that will only be achieved with a sustained commitment by the United States and our international partners. Uh, the United States is committed to that effort uh, and we will be involved in uh, ongoing training efforts there uh, on the ground. For the details about the status of that, uh, training program. I'd refer you to the Department of Defense, who's actually responsible for administering that program. So you're saying that any forces that you're going to train is going to be in coordination with the central government, and it's not going to be separate like you did with the Bishmerga, for example? Well, um, uh, what I was trying to say earlier is that the National Guard proposal is one that has actually been promoted by uh, Prime Minister Abadi and other members of Iraq's central government. Uh, and we are supportive generally of the Iraq central government's efforts to build up the security capacity uh, of forces in Iraq. Uh, and that what they envision, based on the way that I've seen it described, uh, are National Guard units that are based in communities all across the country that would essentially be staffed by individuals who are from that region of the country but supported by the Iraqi central government. Uh, this is an idea that we um, have spoken favorably of in the past, uh, and it reflects the central government's commitment to ensuring that the Iraqi people are taking responsibility for their own security, but also ensuring that Iraq's security forces reflect the diversity of Iraq's population, uh, and that that kind of inclusive uh, governing strategy will be critical to their ongoing success. That's why the United States and our coalition partners have been so supportive of that strategy. As it relates to the specific programs that are targeted to uh, what role U.S. officials would play in training National Guard units, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense for how all that fits together. Okay. Perry, nice I to know, see you. Nice to see you. I know the President can't admit this himself, but the idea of body cameras is his personal view that most police officers, when they see the public, should be wearing a body camera when they're doing so, when they're interacting with the public. Should most officers, in most instances, with the public, be wearing a body camera? Perry, it's the, it's the view of the administration that there are some benefits to police officers wearing uh, body cameras. Uh, and you know, this is a position that the administration uh, actually originally took in a We the People petition, that there was a grassroots movement on our website where people signed a petition about uh, expanding funding for um, law enforcement officials so they could afford to purchase body cameras for their officers. Uh, as you know, the way that this We the People program works, if you go to whitehouse.gov slash we the people, you can examine all of the petitions that have been put forward by people from across the country. Once the, the number of signatures to that petition reaches a certain threshold, uh, an official response by the administration is given to that petition. So it's a way that people can get a direct feedback from the administration on an issue that they care about. There was uh, a, a group of individuals who organized a petition drive uh, around this very issue, about whether or not federal funds should be used to make it easier for law enforcement agencies to purchase uh, body cameras and have their officers wear them on a regular basis. Uh, and in the context of answering that, that petition, uh, the administration made clear that we believe that there are some benefits associated with having officers wear body cameras. Um, I don't think there's anybody who thinks that that's going to solve every single problem uh, or that that's going to address every 
uh, issue related to mistrust that might exist between some communities and uh, their local law enforcement officials. Uh, but there is a, it stands to reason that something like that could have a positive impact uh, on uh, strengthening those kinds of relationships. And uh, that's why you're seeing a, you know, a specific commitment from the federal government to partner with local law enforcement agencies who are interested in purchasing those cameras. Okay. Wendell. Um, on today's meetings, are there any members of the Ferguson Police Department or uh, city government attending? Uh, I haven't actually seen the final list, Wendell. The reason that we have uh, waited until the meeting actually starts to put out the list is we wanted to make sure that we had an accurate, up-to-date list. Now, this obviously was a complicated piece of business that we were working on over the holiday weekend. Uh, but we'll get you that list, and you'll get a chance to take a close look at it when is we it release it. there will be none? Uh, what I do know is I know that there are individuals who were involved uh, with the situation in Ferguson. I don't know if it's government officials, to be frank with you, uh, but we'll find that out when we get the list finalized. As the nation's first African-American president, does Mr. Obama feel a greater responsibility to resolve issues of trust between uh, police and minority communities? Well, Wendell, I can tell you that this is an issue that the president has worked on throughout his career in public service. Uh, if you go back to, uh, you know, probably 20 years ago now, when the president was a state senator in Illinois, uh, you know, one of the principal legislative achievements that he discussed uh, in that legislative body uh, was finding bipartisan ground uh, around legislation that would address concerns of racial profiling. Uh, that there had been concerns expressed by some civil rights leaders in Illinois uh, and law enforcement organizations. And then State Senator Obama worked in bipartisan fashion uh, to broker an agreement between law enforcement and civil rights organizations to try to address those concerns. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is an issue that the President's been focused on for a long time. He talked um, on a number of occasions. He's talked about his own personal experience uh, with, uh, with some of these matters. And um, uh, the pre President certainly believes that this is a, a conversation that is uh, uh, important, uh, not just, again, not just in Ferguson, but it's important that this kind of conversation take place in communities all across the country. Does he feel better able to persuade minorities, African Americans, Latinos, to do what they need to do? Well, it's, uh, I think the President does believe that there is work that we can all do to try to address these issues. And I think the President certainly will be using uh, the strong relationships that he has with uh, civil rights organizations in this country uh, to, uh, to try to make progress on some of these issues. He's also, you know, the President also has strong relationships uh, with local law enforcement officers across the country and that there are some uh, situations in which the administration has worked very closely and effectively uh, with local law enforcement to, um, uh, you know, to, um, to, um, to combat uh, or to, to carry out counterterrorism efforts. Um, certainly local law enforcement officials across the country have been strongly supportive of the kind of bipartisan immigration reform the President has long championed. So there are a number of issues where this administration has worked closely with law enforcement uh, in a way that's been really benefited the country. Uh, and this, I think, uh, would be another example where we feel like we can use those relationships to make important progress that will benefit uh, law enforcement officers uh, as they do their work, uh, but also the benefit the communities that they serve. And I'll ask once again, as been, has been asked before, has the President consciously held his tongue uh, 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 after this issue more than he did so, for example, after Henry Louis Gates' arrest or Trayvon Martin shooting? I think people have seen the President on a couple of occasions now speak uh, in pretty personal terms, uh, or at least in, uh, at least in very thoughtful terms, uh, about his reaction to this issue, both here in the briefing room on Monday evening, but also at the beginning of his event in Chicago on Tuesday evening as well. And that if you go back and look at those remarks, I think the President was speaking uh, in a way that really reflected his own, uh, his own personal thoughts on this issue. As I mentioned, these are issues that he's worked on for a long time, so he's obviously spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, about these issues and the way that the law enforcement uh, officials, again, men and women who put their lives on the line every single day to protect uh, the communities in which they work, uh, they obviously have a significant stake in the outcome of these kinds of discussions. But the President's also mindful of the impact that these kinds of discussions have on civil rights organizations. Uh, the President's very mindful of the impact uh, that, these, uh, that these discussions have on individuals uh, who live in these communities, on individuals who operate businesses uh, in some of these communities. We, you know, there's, there has been some coverage about the way that small business owners have been affected uh, by some of the violence in Ferguson. Um, so there are a lot of people that have a, a stake in this outcome, and I think the President's very mindful of that uh, as he talks about these issues in public. He has not been judgmental, however. Uh, well, judgmental is a pejorative term, so I'm pleased to hear you well, say that the President hasn't been uh, judgmental. I, I think, judgmental but, in the sense that if I had a son, he'd, he'd be like uh, Trayvon Martin. 
judgmental in the sense of calling the police in Boston stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the president uh, has, I mean, I, there obviously are similarities in each of these cases, but there are important differences in each of these cases. Uh, and I think that's how the president uh, considers them. And I think the president has been very thoughtful uh, as he has talked publicly about his reaction to this case. Okay. Major. Josh, a couple things. Uh, the tax extender negotiations, according to some reports, suggest that part of the problem is that there was a perception among Republicans that those who would qualify under the President's DACA procedures for adults would have qualified for some of the tax credits that would be extended. Now, you said a moment ago that it's your understanding that if you pay into the system, meaning Social Security or Medicare, you qualify. Mm -hmm. Would you also qualify for these tax credits under the extenders package under the President's executive action? Uh, the well, the, the extenders package is not quite together yet, but you're talking about the child, child care tax yes. credit, for example? Yes. Uh, yeah, EITC and other things like that. The, the goal of the, uh, the, goal of the uh, executive, one of the goals of the executive action program, or executive action that the President announced as it relates to immigration about 10 days ago, uh, was related to bringing uh, those individuals who've been in this country for some time out of the shadows. Right giving them a work and permit the and out of the books uh, and giving them a social security number right. and making them taxpayers. Correct. Uh, and that does mean that they're going to be filing their taxes on a regular basis. And that does mean that uh, if they qualify for the child tax credit, for example, uh, as a taxpayer, that would be something that they would benefit from. Uh, but, you know, we released this study from uh, the Council of Economic Advisors who talked about uh, the significant economic benefits for the country uh, associated with uh, bringing these individuals out of the shadows so they're not getting paid in cash under the table, but actually, right. uh, you know, sort of part of the broader uh, so economy. You would, you would, under the president's action, have a legal status that is temporary by, by definition, three years. Mm -hmm. For those three years, if you're out of the shadows, you would qualify for some of the benefits, some of the tax credits and earned income tax credit in the extenders package. Correct? That's my understanding. Okay. Let me let me see if we can get you a more specific briefing by somebody who's a little more steeped in the in the details. That's my understanding. Sure understand. That's my understanding of the way the program works. But if I'm wrong, then I will make sure that we get you the right well, answer. Because it was an issue last week. It as, was. As, as things it came, was. came down. Now, it's been also related by White House officials that part of the president's and the administration's problem is that the tax credits would be in some cases extended permanently. Is That's that right. the biggest sticking point? Or does he want others that he prefers that are not yet extended permanently to be put in the permanent category regardless of the long-term cost? Because budget hawks have said, if you do that, you have a package of $500 billion over 10 years added to the national debt. Well, I, I, I can say a couple of things. The first is, I do feel confident that if it were just you and I sitting here trying to negotiate this agreement, that we'd probably get something pretty good hammered out before the end of the day. Unfortunately, well, that's not... Don't you think? Well, you, you're, you're giving me a lot more credit on tax I, policy than I probably deserve. I think you've earned it. I think you've earned it. Um, but I, my point is that uh, this is a complicated process, uh, and there are a lot of people with a lot of different views on it. So this will work its way uh, through that process, and so I don't want to get ahead of it too much. But I will say as a general matter a couple of things. The first is there have been individual proposals from Republicans to make uh, permanent some of the uh, tax uh, credits or tax breaks uh, that benefit well-connected corporations. Uh, the President has previously indicated uh, a willingness to veto those pieces of legislation uh, because, they, uh, because of their substantial cost uh, and because of the, um, that if they went alone, uh, they would be tax provisions that would only benefit well-connected corporations and not working people. So uh, it wasn't a surprise to those who are watching this closely. Uh, that we would have a pretty dim view of a tax extender package that would make permanent uh, a whole host of those corporate proposals. Uh, because again, we have in the past indicated a strong opposition to those individual proposals. So a whole package then doesn't necessarily make them better. Uh, but there were a couple of reasons that we objected to them. The first is because they uh, were benefits that were extended to well-connected corporations and not to working people. Uh, they also would have a pretty um, a hazardous impact on the deficit. So there are a number of reasons to be concerned about it. I'm just asking if those concerns drop if you get more of what you want. Well, uh, we certainly are going to be engaged in conversations with members of Congress uh, about how to move forward. There are uh, strongly held views on a variety of these uh, topics. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be engaged in those conversations and we'll see what we can figure out. On the on-body cameras, uh, a couple of <coughs> departments have already done a pilot program with this. 
uh, without federal funds, done it themselves, found a couple of things. One, it does pro provide a greater public confidence, provided the members of law enforcement use the equipment properly. Remember to turn it on, activate it in, in a way that is not, they just forget, they're doing other things. Is part of this money from the federal government also going to be devoted to not just getting the equipment, but taking this information from pilot programs and training those who take the equipment to use it properly so you don't have a sense where, oh, there was a camera, but they didn't turn it on, and the <coughs> public not unreasonably thinks cover up. Right. Well, uh, that is certainly a part of what's uh, envisioned here, is uh, expanding training for uh, reforms and, uh, I'm sorry, expanding funding for training uh, and reforms, including as it relates to uh, body-worn cameras by police officers. Uh, the, I'm sure this is also something that will be considered by the uh, task force uh, that will report back in 90 days to the president with some best practices about the kinds of things that will um, better uh, strengthen the bonds of trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. Okay. Chris. Thanks. I just want to follow up on the question that Wendell had, which is um, about the president and the role that he plays in this. And he has talked personally uh, about his own experiences. But has that uh, raised the expectations here, or has there been an increased amount of pressure to get things done? Well, I think the president always feels a sense of urgency to get things done, particularly when we're talking about uh, important national priorities like this one. Uh, again, you know, this is. This situation and this sort of addressing this challenge of strengthening trust between law enforcement agencies and the communities they serve uh, has been laid bare in Ferguson in, in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, but this is, you know, there is this kind of underlying tension exists in lots of other communities. Uh, there are some law enforcement agencies that go to great lengths and with some significant success uh, have uh, ameliorated some of those concerns and restored or strengthened the bond of trust that exists between law enforcement and community leaders. I think what they would tell you is that that's a, that is a daily effort, uh, that they spend time every day making sure that they are uh, communicating clearly and being as transparent as possible with the community that they're serving to try to preserve and protect uh, that trust. Uh, after all, you know, that kind of relationship that exists between a community and its law enforcement um, is important to the success of that law enforcement, that if we're going to have uh, uh, law enforcement officials that are committed to uh, preventing crime or uh, investigating crime and, and having them resolved in a conviction, we need to make sure that there is trust that exists between law enforcement officials and uh, the community that's being, uh, where those investigations are taking place or where those uh, crime prevention efforts are underway. So uh, there is, that, that's the, I guess that might be the one piece of good news in all of this, right? That we don't have to choose between uh, strong, effective law enforcement uh, and uh, a strong, uh, bond of trust between law enforcement and that community. Uh, in fact, the more trust that we can build between law enforcement uh, and the community, uh, the better that law enforcement agency is likely to perform. Uh, and that is going to have benefits not just for the law enforcement agency, but it's going to have benefits for the community that they're serving. So uh, there, is a, there is a virtuous cycle uh, that can uh, get started here. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of work, uh, and it's going to require uh, a long-term commitment. Again, not just a single presidential visit to one community, but rather a sustained commitment by the federal government, uh, by people of goodwill on all sides of this issue, uh, to try to uh, address some of these problems uh, that are, again, that are all too common uh, in communities large and small all across the country. And given that that, what all those things that you just said, these are all too common and they're in communities large and small, and certainly Ferguson is not the first example of that, why did it take a Ferguson to take the kinds of steps that we're seeing today? Well, the, the Department of Justice has had a program that uh, has been working to facilitate stronger relationships between civil rights organizations and law enforcement and, uh, and individual community leaders across the country. Uh, but I think, it is, uh, uh, I think it's human nature for uh, a prominent example like the situation in Ferguson to flare up uh, and to prompt a significant reaction from people all across the country. Uh, the situation in Ferguson has, has gotten our attention. Uh, and when I say our attention, I don't just mean the administration. I mean people all across the country. There's a reason that it's still on the nightly network newscasts that you guys are doing every day. There's a reason it's on the front page of, of just about every newspaper across the country today. These, are, these continue to be uh, important issues that, uh, because of the tragic circumstances of, uh, of this one community, uh, has caused communities all across the country to take another look uh, at this issue. I think that is a, a natural human reaction. The question is, uh, are we going to allow our attention to 
uh, to wane, uh, or are we going to sort of use this opportunity uh, and seize this opportunity to make a sustained commitment to dealing with some of these issues? Back to the review, and you stated, as, as it stated, that the, in many cases uh, these programs serve uh, a very useful purpose, and you mentioned the Boston Marathon bombing. Can you be more specific about that example in particular or any other examples in general? Well, I, what, I, what I recall is that there was some uh, very hardened armored equipment that was used in the response to the Boston bombing. Uh, for the more details on that, I'm sure the Boston Police Department would be happy to tell you about uh, how effectively they use their equipment to keep the people of Boston safe. Um, but they'll have a, a, a little more detailed knowledge of that incident than I will. And on a different topic, um, can I get any reaction to the resignation of Elizabeth Lawton, uh, who is the uh, communications director for uh, Congressman uh, Fincher, uh, who made comments about uh, first daughters? Well, uh, I, I'll say a couple things about that. I, I don't have a specific uh, reaction to her resignation. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, I was taken aback that there was some, mm -hmm. you know, a, a political operative on Capitol Hill uh, who did use the occasion of the Thanksgiving, uh, of a Thanksgiving-themed event, to uh, to criticize members of the first family? Uh, I was a little surprised about that, uh, but I will say that there are, um, you know, that she has, uh, you know, posted an apology to her website, and I think that was, uh, you know, an appropriate thing for her to do. Is there a message or a lesson that the White House uh, would like to send? as a result of, of this incident? No, I, I think, you know, all of us, and I think when I say all of us, I mean me and all the people in this room, uh, have the occasion to, uh, to speak publicly with some regularity. Uh, and I think there's a reason that when we do that, uh, we choose our words uh, very carefully, and we try to be mindful of how those words and messages will be received. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if anything, this incident is a reminder of just how important that is. But even apart, would you say, apart from this administration in general, just that uh, first children, first daughters, in this case, are off limits? Well, I think uh, a lot of people observe that, uh, that a principle like that is, uh, I think, is pretty much common sense. So, Thanks. Stephen. Um, on the tax and standards package, I want to get back to the deficit issue a little bit. Uh, the, the, the veto threat last week was basically about the middle class not getting a big enough piece of the pie. It didn't really talk about deficits for the $450 <coughs> million dollars that we added to the debt. Um, <clears throat> wondering if, the, if you guys are going to leave on the table the possibility that the president would sign a $400 billion tax cut package this year, or does it have to be something substantially smaller than that? Well, you saw that there was a statement that was uh, issued by the Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, last week that uh, did raise some concerns about the impact of this proposal on the deficit. So we're certainly mindful of those concerns. This administration has devoted significant time and effort to getting our deficit under control. And uh, under the President's leadership, we've seen the deficit cut in more than half uh, in the five years that he's been in office. So uh, that is a, um, you know, a, a significant achievement and I think uh, was something that was accomplished uh, even in the face of a lot of naysayers and a lot of people who doubted uh, the, uh, you know, the ability to make that kind of progress. In, um, in bringing down our deficit. So we're certainly mindful uh, of those issues and how important they are. Uh, but I will say that our principal objection to the proposal that was floated, uh, at least uh, in the news media, uh, was a proposal that focused uh, on, on um, passing significant uh, tax breaks for well-connected corporations, uh, but not doing a whole lot to look out for working folks. Uh, Has it changed, though, with this administration and how they view the deficit and particularly taxes? Last year, uh, the administration spent most of the year trying to get Republicans to agree to an additional $400 billion in revenue as part of a deal. This year, it looks like at the end of the year, it's going to be negative $400 billion. It seems like uh, that's an $800 billion swing from where you wanted to be just a year ago. Well, <coughs> uh, I think it was two years ago that we were, we were doing this. Well, well, most but of the last years, we yeah. talking, you know, Republican senators were taken out to the restaurant. And yeah. President Fox's dinner, <laughs> yeah. and all, a lot of that was about let's get $400 billion together and they'll do Medicare and Social Security and maybe we'll come up with a deal. And, you know, it all fell apart. But yeah, for, for a brief period of time, again, that, that, was, that was quite a while. It seems like just yesterday to some people, I think, but uh, to others of us, it seems like uh, a generation ago. Uh, well, I will say, just as a general, I, I take your point, though. Uh, and what I will say is that we have raised concerns about the fiscal impact uh, of this specific uh, agreement. Uh, but what also is clear is that we have made substantial progress 
again, that didn't happen by accident, uh, substantial progress in reducing the deficit. Uh, like I said, it's been cut, I think, by like 60 percent now since the President first took office. Uh, and it is below that 3 percent threshold that we spent a lot of time uh, trying to reach, that, you know, that our, what, our, what economists, who know a lot more about this than I do, say, is that uh, we can stabilize the growth of the, the deficit if we keep it below 3 percent of GDP. Uh, and it is now um, uh, in the range of 2.5 to 2.8, I believe. So uh, we've made that progress. And you know, there was a statistic that we talked about quite a bit that over the last two or three years, the deficit has actually fallen uh, under the leadership of the President uh, at a rate more, uh, at a faster rate than at any time since the end of World War II. So we made substantial progress on reducing the deficit. There is a lot of progress that needs to be made, though, in terms of putting in place policies that benefit middle class families and those that are trying to get into the middle class. Uh, and that is at the top of our uh, domestic agenda. Uh, that will continue to be the top domestic priority that this President will be pursuing, even as he works with the Republican Congress. Uh, I recognize that that may not be their top domestic priority. Uh, they may have some other ideas. Uh, but surely, when we examine things like tax reform, uh, investments in infrastructure, uh, investments in early childhood education, uh, we can do those in a way that would uh, resolve uh, the fiscal concerns of my uh, friends in the Republican Party, uh, while at the same time we're making the kinds of investments in middle class families and those who are trying to get in the middle class uh, that we Democrats believe uh, are so important. But the bottom line that this administration, this president, has realized now, you know, two years into his second term, he's never going to get another tax increase out of this Congress. Well, um, I will say that because of the President's leadership and the way that we have structured some of these deals in the past, uh, the President was successful uh, in convincing, or at least passing through a Republican Congress, uh, the first tax increase in more than two decades. Uh, that was part of the fiscal cliff deal. And that was a fulfillment of the President's vision that we should uh, protect tax cuts for middle class families uh, while asking those at the top of the income scale to pay a little bit more, to pay their fair share. Uh, and that is part of why we've seen this uh, 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 improvement in our deficit picture. So, so even at the press conference, when he was standing at that podium, he said, mm -hmm. I want more. You know, he now seems to realize, you seem to realize, the White House seems to realize, this is it. We're not going to get more tax increases out of this Congress. We're willing to actually cut some tax. Well, uh, Stephen, I, the, I, I don't think I quite agree with the premise of your question. There are a lot of ways in which I, we could give you a list of 20 small business tax cuts that have been passed under this administration. We're certainly interested in looking for doing more of that. We've talked about corporate tax reform, in which the President supports uh, closing loopholes for the wealthy and well-connected, while at the same time we're broadening the base and lowering the rate for everybody else. So there, there are plenty of other tax cuts that this administration supports. The difference is we're not interested in just tax cuts for the wealthy and the well-connected. We're actually interested in tax cuts that are going to benefit working people. So if that means that we can, you know, uh, extend and expand the EITC or extend the uh, expansion of the child tax credit, uh, those, are, those are tax benefits that uh, help working people, uh, then those are the kinds of, of tax cuts that we're going we're gonna to support and we're going to continue to do that. And I'm sure they'll be, you know, part of the ongoing conversations that we have with Republicans uh, as they're focused on uh, the kind of tax cuts that benefit uh, wealthy corporations. Okay? Thanks. Roger. I admire your uh, dedication, Roger. Today's your last day at the White House, right? Aww. And so here we are down to the very end, and you're well, I didn't raise your hand. people in that order. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I appreciate your dedication, and uh, I think it's a testament to your record of service here in the White House, Roger. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now that I've embarrassed uh, you, Roger, you, uh, <laughs> can move forward uh, to question. Does the President have a message to the Business Roundtable for Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we'll, including, say, tax extenders? Yeah. Well, you, you unfortunately won't be here to cover it, uh, but uh, your colleagues uh, who will so be there. I set up my colleagues. <laughs> you, you can set them up uh, to do it. I, I think, um, as a general matter, what I can say, Roger, is that uh, the President does look forward to spending some time with business leaders uh, to talk about things that we can do to strengthen our economy. Uh, the President does believe that even though there is a, you know, a Republican majority in both houses of the Congress, there will be at the beginning of next year, that there's still opportunities for us to uh, work together and seize common ground uh, uh, by identifying economic policies that would uh, benefit the middle class and strengthen our economy uh, overall. Uh, some of these are proposals that have been historically supported uh, by the Business uh, Roundtable or you know, individual business executives who are part of the Business Roundtable, even if that organization hasn't endorsed a specific policy. So, name a couple of 
Uh, I'll let the president do that uh, in, a, in, uh, in a couple of days when he does the event. Well, you put a finer point on his uh, position on the tax extenders. As you know, the, the business, especially the R&D tax credit, they would really like to have done. Yeah. The administration has loved the R&D tax credit. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Compromise I, there? I think, well, there could be, uh, but we'll have to, you know, we'll have to work this out with Republicans. But I, I think all my friends on Capitol Hill would think that uh, we've uh, put a pretty fine point on our position uh, as it relates to that proposal already. All right, Justin. Um, I just wanted to follow on tax incentives a little bit. Uh, it seems like the emerging deal that's coming out of Congress now that you have issued your veto threat is that they'll extend everything throughout the end of the year. Um, it, if the kind of package looks the same, but it, it's just through the end of the year and temporary rather than permanent, is that something that the White House would veto as well? Or it, you know, basically, is it a composition issue, or is it? The sort of length of some of these. Issues. Well, I think the, the details of these, of these kinds of proposals are important. Uh, let me say a couple of things. The first is that the, the one year extension that people have, that I know is one idea that's been floated, uh, is actually something that's retroactive. So it would actually apply to the last year. Um, the second thing is there are, as Stephen pointed out, significant fiscal consequences for just a one year extension versus a permanent uh, extension. Uh, and, you know, I've, we've made clear already that some of the fiscal considerations are uh, an important element uh, in these discussions. So, uh, you know, but that, that, that said, I don't have any new veto threats to, to issue from the podium uh, today. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, but at this point, you know, we're going to be engaged in conversations with Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill. Uh, there are some worthwhile proposals uh, that are among those that are being discussed. Uh, we also think there are some worthwhile proposals that aren't being discussed. Uh, which is why we had a, you know, a pretty strong reaction to uh, the original uh, reporting on this. But this will be the subject of ongoing uh, negotiations, and uh, we'll do our best to keep you apprised of those. Well, I'm going to try to bait you into a veto threat anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> You've worn me down now that we've been here an hour and 15 <laughs> yeah. minutes or so that we can. Uh, NDAA is also supposed to hit the Senate floor. Yeah. Uh, you guys have typically issued a veto threat uh, yeah. about Guantanamo Bay detainee transfers. Right. Uh, wondering if you wanted to take that opportunity again, and if you did, uh, maybe explain why you should be believed this time, since it's been something that the President's threatened before, but back down. It's funny that you should ask me this question, and I'll explain to you why. That in, the, in preparing for today's briefing, trying to be a, uh, you know, a good, uh, make this a good use of all of our time, I spent some time with uh, Katie Byrne Fallon, who's our legislative director, to talk through uh, you know, the legislative mechanics of a lot of these issues related to tax extenders and the omnibus and these other things. And, as she was walking out the door of my office, she said, no one's going to ask you about the NDA today, are they? And I said, no, nobody's going to ask you about that, so don't worry about it. Uh, so I am not actually well versed in the details that are included <laughs> in the House NDA proposal. Uh, so tell you what, well, this is what I'll do. I will find Katie between now and tomorrow's briefing, uh, and I'll come back tomorrow prepared to talk about uh, the House version, okay? Uh, Olivia, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Uh, the World Food Program says that it will no longer be able to feed about 1.7 million Syrian refugees. Does the administration have a plan to make up the, uh, the funding shortfall, either through unilateral action or through uh, gathering a, a number of like-minded nations? Uh, Olivia, I hadn't seen that individual report. Uh, the, the administration has been concerned for a number of years now about the urgent humanitarian situation uh, that exists in the region, that there are millions of innocent Syrians uh, who have fled their country uh, because of the violence that take, that's taking place there. And that means that uh, you have some uh, Syrian families who are living in terrible conditions. The winter's getting closer. Uh, I guess we're already in the winter. Uh, the, and, you know, we're, we're very concerned about the humanitarian situation there. Part of the international coalition that the United States has, uh, has built to respond to the situation as it relates to ISIL uh, has involved specific members of that coalition making financial commitments to address the humanitarian situation there. And this is something uh, that the President uh, has talked about in a variety of settings, including on one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with world leaders. So this is something that we're going to continue to be uh, very attentive uh, to. Uh, the United States, as I mentioned earlier, is continues to be the largest bilateral donor of humanitarian situation, uh, assistance uh, as in this situation. Uh, and so there's already been a substantial commitment that's been made by the administration and by the, United, by the American people uh, to trying to resolve this. Uh, but there is, uh, if there's more that needs to be done, then uh, I think you can anticipate that the American president will continue to play a leading role in the international community to try to meet these basic humanitarian needs. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Happy birthday to Natalie. Uh, thank you. I'll let her know.